Hello, welcome to the Into the Digital Future podcast. I am Jordan Shapiro from the Joan Gantz Cooney Center for Sesame Workshop. And I am Laura Higgins from Roblox. And our guest today is Jenny Ito. So a bit of a spoiler, uh, Jenny Ito works with me at Roblox. She uh, works in the uh, safety product team. Uh, she's a child development expert and um, has also previously worked at Google and YouTube. Yeah, this is a this is a really fun conversation where we get sort of an insider's view on on on, on what it's like to think about coming up with policies, rules uh, um, um, at a, at a major platform that so many people's children and so many adults are uh, uh, and uh, are, are 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 on all all the time. And and I, what I liked about this, Laura, is we really got a, just a, a really reassuring um, look at at. Um, it, it just it just what what it, what it's you know how, how people are thinking about this and and that parents can 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 really you know don't don't need to worry so much but also i think we got an honest uh, uh, really honest answers from jenny about about some things that are real that should be real concerns yeah absolutely i think you know jenny as as we are is a parent as well and so she takes her role and her responsibility very seriously um she's always thinking about you know the bigger picture not just the rules for the platform but actually how it impacts the whole community including parents um and she gave us a couple of really good takeaways so hopefully people will feel a bit reassured after listening to this episode yeah well enough of us let's listen to jenny Hi, welcome to today's podcast episode. With me, Laura Higgins. And me, Jordan Shapiro. And today's guest, we have Jenny Ito. Jenny, I'm going to hand it straight over to you. Please, would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Great. Thanks, Laura. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast today. Um, my name is Jenny Ito, and I'm a senior product policy manager at Roblox. Um, before that, I was at YouTube and Google where I was a policy specialist on the Google Play Store. Um, I was also a user experience researcher for a short period of time on the Google Kids and Family team. And then I went back to um, working on policy at YouTube where I led policy development for kids, tweens and teens for YouTube and YouTube Kids. So so you're a, you're in Roblox, which means the two of you work together, you know each other. Yeah. Yes, that's right. We do work together. So do you spend like do you spend lots of time working together, Laura and Jenny? We do. In fact, yeah. I'm very, very lucky. So Jenny, he's going to talk a little bit about her work that she does at Roblox, which is amazing. <laughs> um, but the work that I do at Roblox is all around civility and safety education. And it's amazing how many times Jenny's name comes up in a conversation where I'm like, you know who we need to talk to. Jenny <laughs> and so um, we're really pleased that um, she's been able to support us with lots of different projects that we're working on some of them that are you know um, cross-functional working with lots of different academics um, experts in the field other tech companies and then some that are much more internal projects but yeah I'd pretty much say there's not a day goes by when we don't email or <laughs> chat to each other so it's such a pleasure to have you here Jenny. Oh, well Thanks, Jenny Laura. you're gonna have to explain to me then like what like what do you actually do that makes this <laughs> <laughs> you come up so often in Laura's conversations. <laughs> um, well, as Laura mentioned, she's really focused on civility. Um, and my team is really focused on safety. So um, we like to see we kind of write the write the rules of Roblox. Um, and so uh, we're really focused on keeping um, kids and all our users, actually, because our, our platform is not just focused on kids, um, safe. And so there's a lot of obvious overlap between um, civility and safety. So as Laura mentioned, we work quite closely together. And so what is your what is your like day look like when you're working on safety? Like, what does that mean for, for people who are who, who don't know anything about what it looks like behind other than the app on their phone or their computer or their flat tablet or their console? Like, what does it mean for someone to work on safety? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I would say um, no two days of mine really look alike. <laughs> There's lots of lots of different things that I work on, which makes my job really fun and exciting. Um, so one of the first things um, when it comes to safety is uh, our team drafts policies. Um, and then, which I was mentioning are kind of like the rules of Roblox. And then we work really closely with the moderation team which actually helps enforce those rules and make sure that everyone is, is following the rules on the platform. Um, so a big part of my job is doing research and um, coming up with these policies um, and then working with our cross-functional stakeholders um, to, you know, whether it's product or legal um, to 
to uh, actually um, make sure that these po that these policies make sense um, and that they truly are going to keep our users safe on the platform. But now, but you come but you come to this uh, as a child psychologist, right? Yes, that's right. Yes, my background's in developmental psychology. Yeah. So so I'm curious. Can you can you tell me a bit about how that impacts the, the all these everyday decisions? Like like how 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 does how like. I, I just don't think that most people are imagining that there's like child psychologists sitting there in meetings thinking about <laughs> thinking. Of, so, and, and I know there are, and Laura knows there are. So like, what is that? Like, what, what do parents, uh, how, how would you explain to parents? So like, how did that get, how you get involved in that and how you bring real developmental research to these questions of, about yeah. digital well-being? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so I, I will say that this is um, something that it definitely is more common now. But when I started um, in tech back in 2015, it, it actually wasn't that common to have child development um, or even educational specialists in, in the room or have a seat at the table. Um, thankfully, this has changed over the years. Um, so both at my job at YouTube, but also at Roblox, um, as I mentioned, our users are not just adults. We also have a, a large proportion of our users are actually children and tweens and teens. Um, and when it comes to working or working with policies around kids and tweens and teens, you not only have to think about kids, you also have to think about parents, which is an, a, you know, an additional challenge. Um, so it's definitely something I'm thinking of both um, when we talk about users, when it comes to kids policies, we're th thinking about kids as well as parents. Um, and it's really important when we're developing policies, you know, like children are not just many adults. <laughs> um, so we have to take uh, uh, their, you know, what developmental stages that they're at into consideration. Um, so that's always kind of where I start my policy development is really focusing on the different developmental, um, you know, what changes are happening in terms of social development, cognitive development, um, how that actually can shape their media preferences, mm. and also what type of content might be more risky for them depending on their developmental stages. So really thinking through all of this as we're, as we're writing our policies. Yeah, yeah that, 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 that's fascinating. It is, absolutely. So one of the things I'd really love to understand is kind of two parts to this. So one is how do you tailor those community standards, the rules for a platform, so that they're understandable and digestible by both the parents and, and adults in their lives and also the kids and teens? And the second part being how do you, you know, you kind of mentioned developmental milestones and things like that. How do you keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening out there that's going to affect these kids and teens to build those community standards yes <laughs> it's definitely challenging well I, I had two tweens myself actually a tween I'd rather say a tween and a teenager because he's now 13 so I definitely am I'm reminded every day what's cool and what's not cool from from my children um and also <laughs> yeah. I, I am the not club. cool yeah <laughs> Um, so I have that. Um, but to answer your second question first, um, definitely uh, working with different academics, staying up to date on developmental research. Um, this is actually one of my favorite parts of my job when I do get to interact with um, other experts um, in the field. So that's kind of um, how I keep up to date. Also, um, engaging with our products, you know, playing Roblox. Um, I watched a lot of YouTube when I was at YouTube, <laughs> um, more than you can ever imagine. Um, and also working really closely when I was at YouTube with our content team um, and so they're the ones who are the experts in terms of what kind of content is really appealing to kids and tweens um, so that was a really close partnership that I had when I worked at YouTube just to make sure I really understood um, what's appealing because um, that's actually very important especially when you are um, you are on a platform that's um, there's a lot of tweens and teens on the platform because, um, you know, when kids are younger, it's really all about safety. Um, but once they get to the tween and teen stage, of course, safety is always the most important thing. But we also have to start to really think about appeal, because if they can't find the type of appealing content that they're looking for, they're going to go to a platform that's not appropriate for them, that doesn't have yeah. the safety measures in place for them. Um, and it's very developmentally typical for tweens to want to watch aged up content. So they're really looking for content that kind of pushes a boundary. So how can we give them that appeal? appealing content that makes sure that it's a it continues to be a safe space for them um yeah, and uh oh sorry I'll, i just and quickly about the community standards it's definitely a challenge because especially at a platform like roblox and, and youtube as well where we had you know users of all different ages um we have to make sure that our community standards are understandable um you know to our youngest users um and so as well as um you know don't they're written in a way that is a, you know that kind of works with all the different age ranges, which can be definitely difficult. 
Yeah, so, so so I'm curious just about about how you think about this. You know, with with the younger kids, of course, younger younger kids that fo follow rules pretty pretty well. They they, they like they like to understand them. But as you start to get older, as you get into the tweens and teens, especially at a place like you know any digital platform where yeah. where it feels like their playground, right? Right? Like the like they just see rules as 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 obstacles, right? They're they're just they're just they're all mad about you know they don't understand that any of them are for them or their safety. Right. They're they're just they're just in the way of fun, right? So. So, so how do, how do you think about that as you're starting to think about policy? Because obviously, like we want we want people to understand it. We want them to not, not feel it as something that's like a, a reason to be angry at, at my space, my playground, my my metaverse. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a couple things. Um, one is we're really starting to think about how we give feedback if someone does violate one of our policies. How can we tailor that feedback to different ages? And how can we focus more on education and deterrence versus kind of like a punishment? Because um, we know, especially with tweens and teens, they're going to break the rules. They're going to push the boundaries. You know, so how, how can we communicate to them? You know, you know this actually isn't allowed, um, but we know, you know we're going to give you another chance to, to, so you can kind of course correct that behavior. Um, so, so that's definitely one thing. Um, another thing is really, uh, and I, was, I really liked this part of my job when I was at Google Play. I worked very closely with the user experience um, research team there, um, doing research with um, parents and, and kids and tweens and teens and really listening to, to what they want, um, you know, what they think the rules should be, um, and just like incorporating a lot of that um, feedback where we could. And, and not just after the fact, like getting feedback after we've made up the rules, but thinking about, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thinking about like taking kind of, you know, a child uh, centric approach from the beginning and listening to what they want. Um, as, a, as a parent of a teenager as well, um, there's a common theme here, isn't there? Um, <laughs> when we hear that we, you know, it's perfectly normal for tweens and teens to push the boundaries, to go seek out inappropriate content and sort of to experiment when they're online. I know that that's kind of terrifying to a lot of parents who feel really out of their depth. Is there any advice that you could give um to kind of just normalize not normalize because we don't want it to be normal for our kids but right. to just help parents <laughs> feel empowered in how to manage that situation yeah I, I mean I definitely can relate to how scary that can be I think having open conversations with your kids about and your tweens and teens about what they could see online um and then also what they should do if they do see something that makes them feel uncomfortable um you know if they if they engage with someone and it makes them feel uncomfortable report that behavior if they see something and they're not really sure how to make sense of it talk to your talk to the parents um and also not to over as parents not to overreact when our you know when our kids do stumble upon something that you know they probably shouldn't be seen um because as you mentioned it is very developmentally typical for children to to seek out this type of content um but it also can be you know just looking at a lot of like even sonia livingston's work about what bothers teens and tweens online um you know a lot of kids they they kind of stumble upon things they didn't even know existed like maybe hyper sexualized content mm -hmm. um or something that's really scary in the news um and so i think it's really important to have those conversations with your kids yeah yeah um so so um when, when you look at the um when you look at like the entire landscape of the platforms that that that, that kids and 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 and, and teenagers are using, you know, all you know. I don't want to. I don't want to call any specific one out, obviously, because I'm going to ask you a, 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 a question here. But any of them, whether we're talking about Roblox or YouTube or Facebook or Instagram, you know, we all know them all. Uh, um, like, where do you think are the places where we real where we really need to think about? Uh, you know, I mean, as adults and kids, not at, not as companies, but as adults raising kids, where are the places where we really do need to think uh, uh, about about more boundaries, more rules, better policies, and uh, uh, um, and, and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I think when we look across all platforms, I would say probably um, in the tween and, and teen years, especially when you hit 13. I know for myself, as I mentioned, I have a 13 year old. I had, you know, a parental controls on a lot of these different platforms. And then suddenly at 13, they disappear like completely. <laughs> and so that's a that's a real shift. And so um, I think either having, um, you know, whether it's you know, just really having that communication with your child, but also giving parents uh, the tools to have those conversations. Um, you know, some of these platforms, maybe we need some more extended um, defaults and controls into the, you know, early teen years. Um, because I do think it's quite a shift where, you know, there's all these really restrictive controls and then all of a sudden at 13, they're all completely gone. And if um, a child has, has been very restricted, it can be very overwhelming mm. to kind of have everything open up to them um, with, no, with no limits. 
Yeah, I, I used to, I used to say all the time that everybody gives the kids the phones at thirteen, and I'm and I'm like, you should start with maybe some boundaries younger. Yeah, than still listening to rules, <laughs> yeah. not, not the year. Yeah. Right, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. definitely. I, that was definitely something that you know, I, and it's funny, it hadn't really occurred to me till I got that email saying, hey, by the way, parental controls are no longer on these accounts, and <laughs> and so yeah. <laughs> I agree with you. Amazing. And I'd love to say thank you so much for uh, mentioning one of our dear friends, Sonia Livingston. She's actually previously been on series one of our podcast. Oh, so you're in great company. Great. Um, but yeah, download so... season one and then you can listen to Sonia and everyone else who's great. And then, and then. <laughs> yeah absolutely thank thank you for the plug um this this has been this has been such a lovely conversation and I'm sure you know a lot of our audience who are parents um will find it really reassuring that what they're experiencing is just normal um that's that's the first thing that makes everyone feel better and you've definitely given some really fantastic advice as well um I'm going to take us a little bit into the future now so thinking about new innovations actually one of the projects you and I are working on at the moment is about this kind of what can we do in the next five to ten years so what innovations do you want to see what are you what what new things do you do you feel should be coming or might be coming that that is going to make a lot of this stuff easier for parents and kids to navigate oh my goodness um (laughs) that's a great question um I wish I could see into the future um oh my gosh I don't know I might need a second to think about that one, Laura. That's a, <laughs> that's a big question. So it's, it's okay. You can take a minute to think. We'll either add it like ticker in post-production or we'll edit out the gap. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. What do I want to see in the future? Um, you know, I think, I don't know if this is a great answer, but I think one of the things I've been thinking a lot about, especially at Roblox and kind of this whole metaverse is thinking about how can um, how can we have children and adults interacting in a, in a safe way um, in the same yeah. space, in a shared space, um, you know, because a lot of our other platforms, we kind of have our children's silos um, separate from adults, um, but we are moving towards this uh, world where um, they want everyone interacting together, and that just has so many um, safety challenges. Um, but I also think um, it could be, it can be like the opportunity there is pretty amazing um, for shared experiences, but I do think it's definitely a challenge. It is, but actually, it, you know, the online spaces are a reflection of the real world and we yeah. don't just keep kids locked up in a house. They are, right. you know, as our tweens and teens that we've already mentioned, they are going out. We're sending them to the store. They're going to the park by themselves. They're riding their bike to school. They do have to interact with all sorts of strangers so yeah I think you know for me certainly the the responsibility on a platform to make sure that we can that we're thinking about that and putting tools in place and 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 helping to educate around you know building resilience and, and recognizing risk and harm and all of those things I think yeah. is really important um but yeah I, I it's great to hear that you're you're really thinking about this because you're the person who needs to be thinking about that yeah. stuff <laughs> yeah, yeah and no, understanding I... kind of the or, you know unique risks that are are online that are separate and different from the real world yeah yeah and, and the, you know the only the only way the only the, the best way at least that, that kids are gonna are gonna learn it is to ha- be able to interact in these spaces with their parents it's it's where we it's where we learn most of our, most of what we learn about etiquette and and right. rules and and so yeah. i wish there were more i wish there were more spaces younger and i wish there were more spaces uh older older for it to happen what do you think jenny like what what are the what are the blind spots or the, or just the places where the way that we think about uh, uh, about the digital world, the way we think about the metaverse, where we think about online digital play, you know, where, where, where do you think we have blind spots that actually keep us from, from making the progress that we really need? Hmm. Um, that's a, such a good question. I have to think, sorry. <laughs> that's fine, Jenny. These, these are such great questions. Oh my gosh. Um, I think, um, well, one thing I would say is I think, uh, just, and I, like, again, I mentioned that this is kind of changing over time, but I am happy to see kind of more developmental psychologists, people who really understand kids and tweens really developing like the strategies behind these products, um, and, and kind of, um, really helping with product development, because I think that's really going to help us understand, um, 
and kind of build these spaces uh, with kids in mind and make sure that they actually are um, appealing to them um, and they want to be in these spaces. I think for a long time it was, you know, we didn't have this expertise um, and we weren't involving children from the beginning and, and listening to their feedback. Um, and so I, I hope that we continue to do that as we build out these products. Yeah, same. I think that's, it's vital, isn't it? And, and you know, we know that being part of the product has been a thing with tech spaces and platforms for such a long time. Um, and we have to be even more thoughtful and careful about our duty of care um, yeah. when it's got young people involved as well. Yeah. Um, so, okay, a bit more personal. So what's next for you? <laughs> what big dreams, what things are you working on, whether at Roblox or outside of that? What, what are you currently working on? Yeah, so I can mention something. I think I'm allowed to mention this. Uh, if not, we'll have to edit it out, Laura. <laughs> um, but um, right now, I'm I'm working on um, aging up with the the platform at Roblox, and um, one of our um, biggest growth areas is with our users from 17 to 24. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, right, you know, kind of. I think in the past, it's been more focused on our younger users, um, but now we're focusing on tweens and teens and just making sure that we have appealing content for them um, and making this a, obviously continue to make this a safe space for them. And so um, I did something similar over at YouTube and I, I really enjoy um, enjoy that project because I, um, especially as a mom of a, a tween and teen, it's exciting to kind of be building a space I know my, my own kids are going to enjoy. How, yeah, how, no. how old are your kids? Uh, 10, and 10, 10 and 13. 10 and 13. Yeah. Yeah. And I understand you recently started playing tennis. Do you play tennis with your kids? Uh, <laughs> I think, that, yes, I have started playing. I'm not very good. Um, <laughs> I, but I do play a little bit with my daughter. <laughs> but yes, it's, uh, it's been Who's kind better? of a fun. Uh, oh, I would have to say probably my daughter, sadly, <laughs> even though I'm the one taking lessons, but it's fun. It's fun to get out there. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've definitely been enjoying it. Something to kind of something new to, I've taken up over the pandemic, which has been fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I think thank you so much for, for, for talking to us. It's really it's really been a pleasure. Um, did I make, did, did, did you have any more questions, Laura? I hope I didn't cut you off. Did I? No, no, not at all. I was just going to say how, how therapeutic <laughs> it is to go whack a ball around sometimes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And is it true you, you, your office is in an Airstream? Is that, a, is that, is that a... I, it is. And I did not, I did not record this there today. I was actually thinking that I should, but yes, actually I, over the pandemic, I, you know, with, I had my in-laws come visit my family and they kind of kicked me out of my spare bedroom office, which I'm in right now. Um, and so I used my Airstream in the driveway and I actually realized it's the perfect office. So I usually take all my calls from there. Yes. And it's wow. the shortest commute you could ask for. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> outside to keep it shiny. Uh, you know what? It doesn't even need it. it it's just, uh, yeah, it doesn't even need it. Wow. I, I always love it when I'm talking with Jenny and she just looks like she's in a starship or something. Yes. <laughs> wow. That looks amazing. <laughs> I do get a lot of kind of funny looks as I join calls and they're like, where, where are you? Um, <laughs> but it's very convenient. I have a fridge and a microwave and uh, yeah, it's great. I'd never leave my office. I, I, yeah. Family, you stay in the house. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> there are no cats there, Jordan. <laughs> that's right. No, no pets. Uh, definitely less distracting when, when it comes to my kids interrupting me. So yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Yes. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Thank you, Jenny. It's been such a pleasure. Thanks for listening to Into the Digital Future. We hope you had as much fun listening as we had talking. For links and resources about any of the ideas, projects, or initiatives we discussed on this episode, please visit the Cooney Center website at cooneycenter.org slash future. Into the Digital Future has been brought to you by Roblox and the Joan Gans Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop. Your hosts are Jordan Shapiro and Laura Higgins. Matt Clark is our audio editor and production coordinator. We invite you to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any episodes on Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher and more.